Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we will be talking about very very fundamental, most basic and very very important topic the upper motor neuron lesion versus the lower motor neuron lesion, central facial palsy versus peripheral facial palsy and the peculiar innervation of 11th and 12th nerves. So we will start away with upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron differences to understand the central facial palsy versus the peripheral facial palsy. So the Corticospinal tract, the corticobulbar tract, the pyramidal tract, this is primarily responsible for the movements. It is purely a motor tract. It has got nothing to do with sensory whatsoever. So it's purely a motor tract, the pyramidal tract. So if I need to perform any movement, then this pyramidal tract comes into force. But to understand this, we need to understand a very important concept, upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. So the cortico bulba and the cortico spinal tract starts from the cortex, descends to the internal capsule, supplies all the cranial nerve nuclei, comes to the anterior hansels. From the anterior hansel, what comes out? is the peripheral nerve and from the cranial nerve nuclei what comes out is the cranial nerve. So the upper motor neuron there are two, co two components one the corticobulbar fiber coming up to the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei which is known as the corticobulbar fibers and the pyramidal tract coming up to the anterior hansels, which is known as corticospinal tract. So upper motor neuron has two components, the corticobulbar fibers coming from the cortex to the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei and the corticospinal fibers coming from the cortex to the anterior hansels of the spinal cord. Likewise, we have two components in the lower motor neuron. One, what comes out from the cranial nerve nuclei as cranial nerve is lower motor neuron what comes from the anterior hansel as peripheral nerve is lower motor neuron. So lower motor neuron also there are two components. One the cranial nerves and second the peripheral nerves. Here we need to understand a very important concept. The pyramidal tract is purely a motor tract. It has got nothing to do with sensory whatsoever. So what do we mean by this? It goes to the third nucleus, fourth cranial nerve nucleus. But fifth has got motor, pain and temperature or proprioception three parts. So it goes only to the motor part of the fifth now UK. Then it goes to the sixth now, it goes to the seventh now. It does not go to the eighth now because eighth now is purely a sensory now. It does not go to the ninth now, it goes to the tenth now, eleventh now and twelfth now. And then crosses over to the opposite side at the level of the middle of long and goes to the anterior side. So it goes only to the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei. Another very important concept is that the cranial nerve nucleus are bilaterally innervated. Very important concept. The cranial nerves are bilaterally innervated. Only if we understand this, we can proceed further to understand stroke and the differences between the central facial palsy versus the peripheral facial palsy. So, the cranial nerves, all the cranial nerves are bilaterally innervated. Hence, when there is a lesion on the right side, when there is a lesion on the right side, there is left hemiplegia, left upper limb and left lower limb. But the cranial nerves do not get affected because the cranial nerves get bilateral innervation from the same side corticobulbar tract and from the opposite corticobulbar tract also. Therefore, if there is a lesion on the right side, the other corticobulbar fibers comes and supplies these cranial nerve nuclei and compensates. And therefore, cranial nerves are not involved in the person suffering from hemiplegia except the seventh cranial nerve. 
So none of the cranial nerves are involved in a person having a UMN lesion above the brain stem except the seventh nerve. Why the seventh nerve? I'll I'll talk in a while from now. So in a person who's got a lesion above the brain stem, example right side, they have only left hemiplegia. And though the cranial nerves 3 to 12 are affected, they do not manifest because they got bilateral innervation, not only from the same corticobulbar fibers, but also from the opposite corticobulbar fibers. And therefore, cranial nerves are not involved in a lesion which is above the brainstem, except seventh nerve, which I'll talk about in few minutes from now. Right. Now, again, coming back to the basics, the upper motor neuron, there are two components corticobulbar fibers, corticospinal fibers. Likewise, lower motor neuron also, there are two components, cranial nerves and peripheral nerves. Now, let's see what are the differences between upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion. In upper motor neuron lesion, the bulk is normal. There may be some amount of disuse atrophy, but by and large, the bulk is normal. But in a lower motor neuron lesion, especially example, the anterior hansels, there is severe loss of bulk. There is severe wasting. They, in fact, they are all bones. Example, poliomyelitis, motor neuron disease. When the anterior hansels, the lower motor neuron is affected, there is severe wasting of the muscles. You see only bones. Severe wasting, but no wasting or at, at best there will be minimal disuse wasting in upper motor neuron. Second, in upper motor neuron lesion, the tone is hypertonia, an increase in tone. It could be spasticity or rigidity. Spasticity is you see in UMN lesions, pyramidal tract lesions, where the anti-gravity muscles are more affected, that is flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb, and it is clasp knife spasticity. Initially, it will be difficult, then it will be easier to overcome. Whereas rigidity you see in extra pyramidal tract lesions, where both flexor groups and extensor groups are equally affected, and it is lead pipe, that is the tone, that is it is equally difficult to open up. So, whatever may be, whether it is spasticity or rigidity, there is hypertonia in a UMN lesion. Whereas in, in LMN lesion, it is hypotonia. The tone is decreased. Then, the superficial reflexes. The superficial reflexes have got local pathway as well as another pathway coming from the corticospinal tracts. And therefore, superficial reflexes are absent both in UMN lesion as well as in LMN lesion. Deep tendon reflexes. The deep tendon reflexes are under constant inhibition by the corticospinal tract. And therefore, when there is a corticospinal tract lesion, UMN tract lesion, these reflexes get disinhibited and they get exaggerated. So, in a UMN lesion, the deep tendon reflexes are brisk and in LMN lesions, the deep tendon reflexes are absent. And of course, the most important sign of neurology, the extensor plantar response or Babinski sign, you see in upper motor neuron lesion, where the lesion is above S1, where if we elicit, where we, if we try to elicit the plantar reflex, the big toe goes upwards and the other toe goes for fanning. So extensor plantar response or Babinski sign is seen in upper motor neuron lesions, whereas in lower motor neuron lesions, either it is flexor or absent. The power in upper motor neuron lesions, only groups of muscles are affected. Groups of muscles are weak. For example, extensors of the upper limb and flexors of the lower limb are weak. Since extensors of the upper limb are weak, but the tone in flexors are increased, and since flexors of the lower limb are weak, but extensor muscles of the tone, that is an increased tone, person will have a flexion of the upper limb and extension of the lower limb, where he cannot flex the knee, and therefore he walks like this. This is known as circumduction gait. Because he is not able to flex the knee, to clear off the ground, he has to encircle and then walk. So you see characteristic patient walking like this with the flexion of the upper limb and extension of the lower limb and encircling. This is a very classic gait known as circumduction gait where you see in UMN lesions. Whereas in LMN lesions, it is not the group, it is the individual muscles which are affected. For example, the C5 is affected, biceps, infraspinatus, rhomboids, deltoid and supraspinatus are affected. So in upper motor neuron lesions, groups of muscles are affected, whereas in Whereas in lower motor neuron lesions, individual muscles are affected. In upper motor neuron lesions, you don't see fasciculations, but in lower motor neuron lesions, you see fasciculations, involuntary muscle twitchings. 
This is because of Cannon's law of denervation supersensitivity. When anterior horn cells are affected, it becomes super sensitive to its chemical. Here, acetylcholine. For example, the anterior horn cell is affected, it becomes super sensitive to acetylcholine, and therefore, even if there is no voluntary impulse coming, involuntary the muscles will start twitching, which is known as fasciculations because of Cannon's law of denervation supersensitivity. So you see fasciculations in lower motor neuron type, but in upper motor neuron type, it is absent. So to put it in a very simple manner, in a lesion which is above the brain stem, there is hemiplegia on the opposite side because the tract crosses the level of the middle organ and goes to the opposite side, but cranial nerves are not involved because cranial nerves are bilaterally innervated and therefore if my right corticospinal tract gets affected, there will be only left hemiplegia, but the cranial nerves on the right side are not affected because they get bilateral innervation, except seventh nerve, very very important. Why in seventh nerve, why only the seventh nerve gets affected in a lesion above brainstem? This is the explanation. The seventh nerve, you can see it is in the pons. Now I have enlarged the nucleus of the seventh cranial nerve in the pons. The seventh nerve nucleus has got upper part and the lower part. The seventh nerve nucleus has got upper part and the lower part. The phase you divide it equally into upper half and the lower half. The upper part of the nucleus supplies the upper part of the phase. The lower part of the nucleus supplies the lower part of the phase. Fine. Now, there is an upper part and the lower part of the facial nerve nuclei. Like all the other cranial nerves, the upper part of the facial nerve nucleus has got bilateral innervation. For example, on the right side, the right upper part of the facial nerve nucleus supplied both the, by the right corticobulbar fibers as well as the left corticobulbar fibers. But the lower part gets supplied only from the opposite side. This is the peculiarity, this is the uniqueness. This is the catch. That's why in a lesion above brainstem, none of the cranial nerves are involved except seventh nerve. So this is the explanation. So the lower part of the facial nerve nucleus has not got bilateral innervation like other cranial nerves. It has got unilateral innervation and that too from the opposite side. So what is upper motor neuron? Anything above the nucleus is upper motor neuron. Anything below the nucleus is lower motor neuron. So in the upper motor neuron or central facial palsy, when there's a lesion, the upper part, the fibers, the upper part, this gets affected, but this is compensated by the left side. Finally, only the lower part of the facial nerve nucleus on the opposite side gets affected. Lower part supplies the lower part of the face, and hence the lower part of the face only gets affected in right human lesion. So finally, when there is a right human lesion, only the lower part and that to opposite side of the face gets affected. So a person who has got lesion above the brainstem on the right side example, he will have left hemiplegia and only left lower part of the face getting affected. Now we see LM. LM is a lower motor neuron lesion. So the final pathway is gone. Example, Bell's palsy. So when the final pathway is gone, both the upper part and the lower part on the same side are affected. So in LM lesion, both the upper part and the lower part on the same side is affected. Whereas in a UM lesion, lower part on the opposite side is affected. Now let's try to find out the differences between the central facial palsy that is upper motor neuron of facial nerve and peripheral facial palsy that is the lower motor neuron of the facial nerve. But before that I need to introduce a concept which is known as Bell's phenomenon. Bell's phenomenon is a reflex up gaze with forceful eyelid closure. When I close my eyelids, my eyeball goes upwards. This is a normal phenomenon. So Bell's phenomenon is a reflex up gaze when there is a forced eye closure. What is the mechanism? The mechanism is that the levator palpebrae superioris and the superior rectus, both supplied by the third nerve, they are matched tone wise. That means when the eye looks down, both the tone of both the muscles are decreased. But when the when a person looks upwards, there is an inhibition of the levator palpebrae superioris, but the excitation of superior rectus. So, Bell's phenomenon is a normal reflex up gaze when there is a forced eyelid closure. The levator palpebrae superior which is responsible for the elevation of the eyelid and the superior rectus which is responsible for the elevation of the eyelid. The tone of these two muscles are matched. They are equally matched when they look downwards. So when they look down, they are, they are matched. So down gaze, they are both are inhibited. Since levator palpebrae superior is inhibited, the eyelid drops down. Since the superior rectus muscles is inhibited, the eyeball goes downwards. So when a person looks downwards, both the levator palpebrae superioris 
and the superior rectus muscle are inhibited and therefore there is eyelid drooping and the eyeball comes down but when a person looks upwards the levator palpebrae superior is is inhibited that means eyelid drops but superior rectus now the tone is not decreased it is increased and therefore the eyelid the eyeball moves upwards so when they look upwards the tone reverses there is an inversion of the tone so the levator palpebrae superior is the tone decreases so eyelid falls down but the superior rectus the tone increases and therefore the eyeball moves upwards so this is bell's phenomenon so bell's phenomenon is the reflex of gaze when the when there is a forced eyelid closure it is a normal phenomenon when i ask anyone to close the eyelids when they close the eyelids i can see the eyeball moves upwards but i can't see in normal person because they close the eyelids but in persons with bell's palsy when the upper part of the face is affected when they attempt to close the eyelids they cannot close the eyelids because the orbicular ocular is, is affected but you can see the eye eyeball moving upwards so bell's phenomenon is a normal person but well seen in persons with bell's palsy because they cannot close the eyelids but the moment they attempt to close the eyelids you can see this reflex getting manifested so now let's see what is the difference between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron or central facial palsy from the peripheral facial palsy the lesion is above the nucleus in the upper motor neuron the lesion is below the nucleus in the lower motor neuron when there is a when there is an upper motor neuron lesion the lower half of the face gets affected when there is an lmn lesion both the upper part and the lower part on the same side gets affected in upper motor neuron lesion the bell's phenomenon is not well seen because they can close the orbicularis ocular but in an lmn lesion the bell's phenomenon is well seen because they cannot close the eyelid because of the orbicularis ocular weakness but the moment they attempt to close the eyelid you can see the eyeball moving upwards the corneal reflex is present in upper motor neuron lesions but the corneal reflex is absent in lower motor neuron lesion because the afferent for the corneal reflex is is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve efferent is bilateral facial nerves and therefore when the facial nerve gets affected which supplies the orbicularis ocular the corneal reflex is absent so a person who is having element facial nerve type of palsy they will have the corneal reflex being absent the facial reflex like in upper motor neuron lesion the reflexes are brisk whereas lower motor neuron lesion the facial the reflex are absent so facial reflex is that wartenberg's orbicularis ocular reflex we have to pinch the muscle between the, at the lateral canthus and then percuss it behind the towards the ear and you can see nice contraction of the muscle so the upper motor neuron type of facial palsy or central facial palsy the wartenberg's orbicularis ocular reflex is brisk whereas here it is normal or absent in an element facial palsy then as i said this pathway coming from the cortex to the pons you have a voluntary pathway for upper motor neuron or facial palsy you have an emotional pathway also coming the path is not well known but it can go towards towards the cingulate gyrus or thalamus and then come to the facial nerve nucleus so upper motor neuron or facial you have basically two components the supranuclear path is one the voluntary component second is the emotional component so a person have may have only the voluntary component being affected whereas emotional component may be normal so when when you ask the person to clench it to open to show the teeth you can see nice flattening of the of the angle of the mouth and de getting deviated towards the opposite side if you give a command but when he smiles automatically it may be normal so there is voluntary and emotional dissociation sometimes for example thalamic infarct when they smile the the facial palsy may be there but on voluntary command it may not be there so supranuclear facial pathway has got two components one the voluntary component second is an emotional component so both can be dissociated only the voluntary part can get affected wherein when you give a command you can see the facial palsy but when they smile automatically emotionally it may be normal on the other hand when they smile it may get affected but voluntary when you give command it may be normal so there could be a voluntary emotional dissociation in a human lesion but in element lesion both are affected right initially as for the sake of simplicity uh, simplicity i said that the all the facial nerve all the cranial nerves are bilaterally innervated except seven but there are two peculiarities one for the 11th nerve one for the 12th nerve the 11th nerve which supplies the sternocleidomastoid has got predominantly unilateral innervation so the cortex 
supplies the unilateral, the ipsilateral sternocleidomastoid. And therefore, when there is a right cortical lesion, the sternocleidomastoid on the same side gets affected. So it cannot turn the head towards the opposite side. The head will turn towards the same side. So another peculiarity. So generally, the scheme is that the cranial nerves get better, better innervation from the contralateral side. But here, the sternocleidomastoid, which is supplied by the 11th nerve, has got more of ipsilateral contribution. And therefore, when there is a right-sided lesion, the ipsilateral, the same side sternocleidomastoid muscle gets affected. So person cannot turn the head towards the opposite side. The head will be turned towards the side of the lesion. And another important uh, peculiarity or the exception is the genioglossus supplied by the 12th nerve. Genioglossus of all the muscles has got predominantly contralateral supply. And therefore, when my right cortex gets affected, the left-sided now supply in the genioglossus gets affected. Genioglossus pushes the tongue to the opposite side. And since the genioglossus muscles, the nerve supply gets affected, the 12th gets affected, it is pushed towards, pulled towards the same side. So the genioglossus of the 12th nerve has got a predominant contralateral supply. The 11th nerve supplying the sternocleidomastoid has got a predominant ipsilateral supply. The 7th nerve, the upper part has got bilaterally innervated, but the lower part gets predominant innervation from the contralateral side. These are the peculiarities of the 7th nerve, 11th nerve and 12th nerve. So, this is an overview of the differences between upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion and central facial palsy and peripheral facial, facial palsy and these are the peculiarities of the 7th nerve, 11th nerve and 12th nerve. I hope it was a very interesting lecture and you have understood the basics and enjoyed it. I have enjoyed giving the lecture and I hope you have also enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have really liked the lecture, please like and subscribe and post your comments on my YouTube channel, Dr. Sinwas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Sinwas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.